Mark Sullivan, who's one of my co-workers at the Internet Archive, walked over while I was on site last week and said, I I've got something I'm looking for, and you seem like the person who might be able to find it. And I never turn away from a challenge. So Mark showed me, in a rough sort of way, what he was looking for, which was a flight simulator from around 1985, 1986, that he remembered playing on his CPM K-Pro computer. He told me that it didn't have any graphics. It barely had any instrumentation. Pretty much everything was text. He knows that it was written in MBASIC, and he knew that it was probably some sort of user group uh, creation. Uh, go. <laughs> Do your best, Jason. So I told him I think we could find it in very short time, and I tweeted about it. Within 48 hours, we had it. But the process of getting there really reminded me of both how far and how not far we've come. This is Jason Scott. You're listening to the Jason Scott Talks His Way Out of It podcast, a podcast about technology, history, and getting myself out of debt. Thanks to Jeff Atwood, Brenda Romero, Daniel Boyd, and the hundreds of other supporters on Patreon and other sources uh, who are helping me work my way out of debt. The program itself is completely unremarkable and in some ways completely beside the point, but it was called DC10.BAS and it is basically a, a simple flight simulator. Uh, there's no real geography. You start it up and it gives you some instructions and then you manipulate what are meant to be instruments. I did a search on the Internet Archive, first for the name DC10.BAS, which gave nothing, and then looking through the full text search. From that, we were able to find an advertisement in one of the computer magazines of the 1980s where it was mentioned. This particular program was part of something you could buy from this ad, which made itself clear that it was a collection of public domain software and they were just making it easier for you to get to it. So we put it up on Twitter and then we let everyone know we were looking for it. People started to respond almost immediately and naturally Flight Simulator set some folks off as well as uh, the idea of being a user group creation. Now, user groups, if you uh, are not from that time or perhaps didn't get into this at the time, user groups were, and in a different sort of way are, one of the vital shadow aspects of the uh, adoption and continued usefulness of computers. It's wonderful that we have these machines and that people could take them home and, and tinker with them. But Without that social aspect, the idea of bringing your computers or, or even your ideas to a group uh, along with snacks or maybe over a table at a restaurant and hashing out both your discoveries and other uh, people's insights, we wouldn't advance as far as we have. Uh, companies have been created from these user groups. The documentation from these groups when we could find them are some of the most vital insights into how the technology works. Up on the Internet Archive, we've added thousands of issues of user group newsletters where they're basically mimeographed sheets talking about both meetings and subjects to be discussed and occasionally articles written about things that have been discovered about whatever the newsletter is about. Uh, these groups persisted all the way back in engineering history. There's an argument that they existed in the industrial age, people meeting up in the 19th century to talk about their steam engines or advancements with metal work to, to be able to make machines run better. Uh, one of the most famous user groups to exist was DECUS, the uh, Digital Equipment Corporation User Society, which frankly, is the driving force behind a lot of the adoption of digital equipment through the entire 20th century. These groups met all over the world and would have major meetings, small meetings, and the work that they did, especially in sharing software, uh, stands as the main insight into that company and its work 
as microcomputers uh, took flight in the 1970s and 1980s, user groups flourished. Uh, not only were they able to have all of the abilities and powers of previous user groups, they could bring the machines along with them. Just load your Apple II or your Commodore into the back of your car, drive to where you're meeting, and share things right there, up to and including copying software that was available. For this reason, if something was a pretty well-made uh, piece of software, whether it was a game or a utility, it got shared very quickly. Combine this with bulletin boards, and suddenly you had a library of software at your fingertips. There are a number of user groups that persist to a strong degree into the 1990s before the internet really starts to shut things down. Bulletin board systems were helpful, but the internet just took away a lot of the usefulness of a user group meeting, certainly the parts about transferring software and documentation. I mean, once you put it up on an HTML page or made a PDF available, people didn't need to sit there copying or borrowing anything. I mean, they still met. I still go to a user group meeting of sorts in Kansas Fest every year, but we didn't have that vital uh, mirror aspect of the online world and the offline world. In putting together Apple II software for the collections on the archive, uh, a lot of the really good stuff came from user group libraries. You see, user groups would have sets of floppy disks that had specific numbers, and you could order different floppy disks from this catalog that they would print. Uh, so imagine a 32 or 64 page catalog with listings in it and short capsule descriptions of different public domain software. And then you would borrow a floppy or be sent one if you paid for it. And you would have software immediately uh, without having to pay $39 and hope that it was good or to do something simple or get inspired. And of course, you'd be able to look at the source code and make things better yourself or even improve it and make a, a version 2.0. It was very back and forth. And that functionality uh, of the library of the user group was why uh, when I started imaging them for the archive. We were able to uh, go to remaining houses. I went to the uh, remaining collection of the Rhode Island Apple Users Group, uh, REAG, and it was in a woman's basement. And, and she walked us over to the shelf, and, and I'm sitting there looking at what are dozens and dozens and dozens of disc boxes, classic plastic floppy disk boxes. And I remember I filled my car that day and loaded them all back to my home. All of them have been imaged. And of course, this truckload quickly became at most a few hundred megabytes of space, but they, they represented years of refinement from REAG. And as each member had kind of gotten out of the whole hobby, they had given it to the next person and the next one. And, and that's why it ended up at this house. I've since put the REAG floppies both into the Internet Archive store and into the uh, store of a fellow named Kevin Powers, who's been an incredible collaborator with a lot of Rhode Island-based Apple history. There are other user groups out there. I am sure that at this moment there are basements that still have the full untapped libraries. Uh, how many more of these caches are out there? Uh, so getting back... Uh, to this DC-10 program. It didn't take long for a fellow named Stuart Russell to come along and say, I think I found the program. The program actually is located here on our Toronto Pet User Group collection, uh, which they still sell. And so he just gave me the DC-10. And the interesting problem was you, you'd think that basic, you know, something in the basic language, that'd be easy but it was tokenized. If you haven't really heard of the term tokenization, the way that a lot of basic programs were able to save space is that they had a replacement number or replacement character for certain standard basic commands. So instead of the list command, it might say five and be marked as a token, or maybe it would be a certain control character. And if you didn't know that code, 
when you tried to bring it back, it would just look like a bunch of jumbled numbers. Although you could, of course, look through the strings to get the main idea of what you're looking for, usually a name or some sort of instructions. But we put it up and we had another person go through and heavily reverse engineer the basic tokenized version. And suddenly we had the full DC-10 program available again. In some ways, this is a huge success. The ability within 48 hours to find a program that was just a half-remembered memory on the part of Mark, that's great. But it wasn't where we could easily find it. It took multiple people. It took reaching out to a 25,000-person audience and begging them to find it. And the value was arbitrary. It wasn't inherent. You couldn't look at this program and go, well, this is a very special program. In fact, it might not be a special program. It might be a variation of a previous one. Perhaps it's not very well written. It was very valuable as a memory to Mark, who was obviously inspired enough by it to go on and become one of the developers for the Wayback Machine. I mean, he's doing his work and having a great time there, and, and, and suddenly we were able to bring back a small part of his childhood. I'm a little worried about this miasma. The fact that we have stuff, and it's out there, and making it something you can cross-reference, um, we're not there yet. Uh, this is partially why I grab things with such fervor. You know, I'd much rather grab a, a 17 gigabyte collection of everything that's on an FTP site and just work it out later than uh, try to pick through and find what's inherently obviously important and then leave the, the chaff there because I suspect a lot of that chaff is just simply non-intuitive value. It's an interesting, interesting problem. So those user groups had a different value as well. And of course, I'm talking about friendships. Uh, there are people you would meet in a dark uh, world of not knowing others who loved computers as much as you did. And the, the wonder of meeting up once a month with people who thought like you did or were excited like you were or had ideas to share with you and maybe collaborate, you know, this was a priceless, priceless resource that these user groups put together. Uh, at the beginning of the BBS documentary production, I was alerted to the Chicago Area Computer Hobbyists Exchange. This was the user group that existed that led to the birth of the dial-up BBS. Both Randy Seuss and Ward Christensen were members, and, and it was for that user group they even worked on uh, a bulletin board system. And that group had continued to meet up into uh, the 2000s when I was doing my production. Now, that group has died out. In fact, there's not a whole lot of really good resources online to, to see pictures of what they were doing, I guess, other than the interviews that I conducted of some of the members, some of whom are gone already. Uh, the, the Chicago Area Computer Hobbyist Exchange, CASH, that was a vital multi-decade project to make computers have meaning and usefulness. How many more of these social clubs are going to disappear under the sea without a trace? Now, obviously, the user group urge, the urge to meet with others like yourself and share what you're working on, that's persisted into the modern era. We see it in code sharing, like on GitHub. We see it on places like Stack Overflow or even uh, Reddit and Hacker News discussions where people will share what they're working on and say, does anyone have any ideas here? I wired this to this, or I just came out with an initial version of this. Does anyone have any feedback? And that's how collaborators happen. That's how you find out that there's some value and importance to others about what you're working on. Uh, there have been these weird cat nippy projects, these projects that everyone hears about and they get super excited about. Now, the number of people when the crowd washes away who want to sit with you and help you bring it to the next level, 
You know, those people are gold, and you have to go through uh, hundreds or thousands of people, onlookers who uh, stop by and say, yep, neat, and then disappear before you get that really special core team who says, you know, I took your thing, I reverse engineered it, I, I found some inefficiencies, I'd like to uh, uh, share them with you if that's okay. You know, when we work on this in-browser emulation, the amount of people who want to help uh, versus the amount of people who can sit there and, and go upstream, I mean, the ratio is, is, is horrifying. And the various projects of emulation in the browser, I'll confess to you, we got a few casualties. We have people who uh, got into the project, started to do the foundation work, and then found themselves getting more and more uh, aggressively angry at, at the code and the code base and trying to figure out the problems to the point that they just walk away running. Uh, it's just too much. And anything in life that can distract them and pull them away, they'll do it. Uh, we've lost easily a half dozen people that way. Uh, there's one person who uh, quit, who said one of the most amazing things to me. Maybe it's time to share that. So with no details behind this, I I'm just going to tell you uh, what he said to me because it's resonated with me for the years afterwards. Uh, he had done some incredible work with emulation with us. He had uh, shot far beyond what would be expected. It was the kind of work that needed weeks of hard study to optimize and make work. He was doing super intense bite by bite work, the kind of Swiss watchmaker effort that you only get out of a few people and which was very vital at the beginning of working with in-browser emulation because everything depended on a compiler called mscripten and it was all new and mscripten was not always efficient. But this hard worker, uh, he was focused, so focused in fact, as he indicated later, that he wasn't sleeping and he wasn't eating properly and he was doing all-nighters and then collapsing and, uh, you know, taking terrible care of himself. But he had another problem, one which he confessed to me before he walked away, leaving behind him a program and a uh, optimization that people use by the thousands now. What he said to me was that he could not look away from the problem of emulation, that Emulation was a fascinating set of puzzles to work through. But it was his strong and, and distinct, non-ironic, true belief that our focus on emulation would destroy, destroy a generation of young people. Here's the thinking. Emulation turns an entire history of computers into an easily accessible library, the kind of library you would have with a user group. And this library would always be there to distract, to fill time, to take the effort and drive that a person might use to innovate or make the world better or love other people and focus it entirely onto these computers. That is to say, the in-browser emulation was a devil's bargain, an incredibly fascinating puzzle that would absorb the soul of future generations. And he had done his best to fight this, but he had continued to sit focused on the emulation problem, doing the byte manipulations, doing the intense programming and analysis to get every cycle working, realizing that his every advancement and step was destroying the future of countless young people. And he had reached a point where he could not, in good conscience, take another step. I looked at that letter a long, long time.
You've been listening to the Jason Scott Talks His Way Out of It podcast. Thanks to James Bakoyanu, Sam Johnston, and the hundreds of other supporters who have been helping me get out of debt. You can always reach the podcast at podcast.textfiles.com. I'm on iTunes, Libsyn. I'm sitting around on all the main podcast apps. Easy to find, easy to share. People have uh, given me great feedback, and they're excited by possible subjects I can cover. And with 33 episodes down, it's becoming quite a body of work. Hey, a little more about that guy. So he, he's kind of backed off on this extreme view of what the computers do, but I do believe he does have a point. There is always this... A floating possibility of letting obsession and hyper-focus into something uh, really imbalance and hurt your life. Uh, if you find that you are so focused on something that you are failing to do uh, basic self-care or uh, friendships who, who are fading because of your obsessions, that's a sign. I mean, I myself have certainly seen the sun come up while I've been you know, just slamming away on a project and realize, oh boy, I am not going to see noon today. And that's not always healthy. I love the thrill of pushing through and solving something. There's no question about that. But taken to extremes, it's not great. So I guess I'm just saying... Think about the friendships around the things you do and not just exclusively about the things you do. Uh, those friendships, uh, they're going to they're gonna last a lot longer than the latest revision or the latest solved puzzle. See you next week.